So, Seamus, how's things going? Very good, Paul. I, uh, a few weeks ago I told you the story of... I went to clean my keyboard, but I must have inadvertently got a dot of water into a couple of the keys and, and killed my keyboard. And then I went to buy another of this exact model because it's my, the favorite keyboard I've ever owned and saw that it was $250 or, or $280. It was just absolutely, I couldn't, I couldn't justify spending that much on a keyboard. You get like a whole computer for that price. Right, right. I mean, it is a really good keyboard. So then I I bought another keyboard that also does the, the rainbow thing and the rainbow lights and had most of the features the I Z wanted. machine or something. Right, and my, my son looked at it and he was really excited. He's like, oh, look, it has programmable macro keys, and he loves that. He's got this macro program where he sets up all kinds of strange stuff and I don't know he just loves programming keyboard stuff it makes him happy and I said well look you like this keyboard I will give it to you if you can fix my old one <laughs> ah. and it was way harder than either of us suspect I mean I just thought that I was never gonna fix it I was never gonna even attempt it I just I get nervous working on stuff, even if it's broken and going to be thrown away, and I get stressed out, and I didn't have time. I'm just, I'm already spinning too many plates. And it was way harder than we thought it was going to be. He had to buy new, there's the tops of keys, the physical thing you see, and then uh, underneath, I think the mechanical switches, I forget the name for those, if they're just switches. One of them's called keycaps, and the other one's called switches. I forget how it all works. But anyway, needed to replace some of them, needed a special tool to get them off, needed to do some soldering, and he just, he did it. He figured it out, got the keyboard repaired, and it is like new. Awesome. I was, yeah, I was delighted to give him that new key. He's happy, he's got this keyboard with all these extra keys and all this macro stuff you can do and I've got my beloved Corsair keyboard back so oh, good, good job Isaac I realize that's um not a big deal to most people but I I spend like probably probably 14 hours a day using this keyboard so it's a big deal to me <laughs> yeah absolutely I had a keyboard at work that was supposedly a, quote, mechanical, unquote, keyboard. And I have a pretty nice one at home. And so I went to work and, you know, they're like, hey, you want some hardware to get you a keyboard? I was like, sure. You know, so I ordered this keyboard and it came in. And it was just not enjoyable to type on. Like, it was so unenjoyable that I would put off typing stuff until I got home so that I could type. Not that I ever typed personal right. things at work. But if I had been tempted, I wouldn't have been tempted. Right, because it was just so awful. Yeah, so, was, ugh. have you ever experienced the thing where you, you know, you've got the, the membrane keyboards, mm -hmm. and then there's the mechanical switch keyboards. Whenever I switch from one to the other, I hate it. Uh, back in the day, when all keyboard, they just dropped mechanical switches in the late '90s, and it was all membranes, and I hated it. It just felt like I was typing on a, on a pillow, you know. But then I got a keyboard and I was like, oh, I, I go to a mechanical keyboard again. And it was like, oh, this is so noisy and just so, so much work to push the, the switches down. But then after, you know, a year of that, then I'm like, go back to a keyboard and I hate it. So it's like, no matter which way I'm going, I hate it. <laughs> did, did you ever get that? I, and what's your preference I, I don't know. between I've, the two? I've never, yeah, I've never had a strong preference because I don't type that often. Um. The most typing I ever did was on a, a laptop when I was writing the finishing Fall from the Sky. Um, and that wasn't too bad. They were It was short keystrokes, but they were mechanical keys. And so they had that uh, tactility to it. The thing that it is important to me is that if I barely miss the key, I want to be able to tell. And I want to not mistype the, the letter. And uh, with a short stroke key... It's not so bad because when you, your finger doesn't go that far and so it doesn't mistype. And, um, but if you have a deep stroke with that, uh, the really soft 
uh, membrane keyboard, then it's really easy to just accidentally hit the wrong keys and it's just, it just drives me crazy. So I, it's not really a membrane mechanical thing. It's just like I want it to ha have enough resistance that I can uh, be off a little bit and not cause problems for myself. So I'm really curious. I, I want people to leave a comment down below. Do if, for those of you, if you don't, if you don't care, then you know that's fine. But if you have a strong preference, I never hear people exper express a strong preference for membrane keyboards. And but they, they're the most com common kind of keyboard, so they must have their fans. They're cheap to produce. Yeah, I remember back in the day when I was still smashing keyboards. I just, like, would get, like, a <laughs> stack of... My, my brother and I were joking about this the other day, but it's kind of true. You know, you you just smash a keyboard, and then you pull a, a fresh one off the pile and plug it in and keep going. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm much less... I imagine some of it is because I'm on better drugs these days for my asthma. And... Some of those drugs are hormone based. <laughs> and so and so that's probably where a lot of my problems were coming from. Plus I just have, you know, bad temper to begin with. But yeah, membrane keyboards, that's that I use membrane keyboards for like a decade just because it's too expensive to um, use a mechanical keyboard if you have a propensity for smashing things. Use it to death. Yeah. Right. The only time that I've experienced experienced run to, well, I guess I've a couple times destroyed keyboards. Um, once the first time is a long time ago. We were playing Mech Warrior, my brother and I, and uh, what were we doing? I was running. I was running half of the control because you know there's all those controls, and we were like ten or something. Right. And uh, so he was running the weapons, and I was running like the steering or whatever. And uh, he was trying to to do an alpha strike, and the the mech wasn't responding because it was recharging some of the weapons or something. So like when you do an alpha strike, it has to wait for all the weapons to charge up. And the alpha strike was space bar. And so he didn't like smash the space bar trying to get it to do an alpha strike because he was just so into the moment. And uh, that right. keyboard did not work again. I mean, everything else worked, but the, the space bar was broken. And then the other time was I was in a, a road trip and we had some D&D 3.5 edition manuals sitting on the like I was sitting in the back and it was one of those um, sedans. So it had the little shelf above the back seats. And that's where he had all our, our D&D manuals right. stacked up. And so I was working on my laptop and they slowed down and the books slid off over my shoulder. And one of them landed corner first into my keyboard on my laptop. And uh, oh, that did no. not do it any favors. Oh, that's heartbreaking. And then there's the water stuff. I've never done it, but my wife has, has spilled water on keyboards before, and you just pop them out and replace them because they're not. It's usually not eight hundred or not eight hundred. It's you know three hundred dollars. Anyway. Yeah. So anyway, I'm curious where people's preferences are for keyboards. If anybody wants to leave a comment about that. So what have you been up to? Well, I've been playing some video games this week. Uh, I saw Exapunks going on sale for at uh, the GOG, and so I got a copy of that. I think I mentioned it last week that I picked up a copy. I don't know. Maybe I did. Right. I've been getting, I just realized now that I've been getting Exapunks and Cloudpunk confused in my head. <laughs> Those are very different games. I haven't played Cloudpunk, although it looked pretty interesting. It looked like more of a, like a story game than a, than a sim, though. Yeah, it does. The, uh, it, Exapunks is a very fun programming heavy, uh, game. Um, Zachtronics, uh, puzzle game with lots of programming stuff in it. Uh, I'm not going to spoil anything. You know, it's, it, it's, there's a lot of good material, but one of the cool things about it is that it's got an in-game manual that you can print out. So it's got PDFs that you can open, and then it's also got versions that you can print out. So they're like print on both sides, staple it together, fold it in half, and you've got this little booklet that's supposed to be, that's, that's actually the same as the booklet in game that one of the characters gives to your character and so it's this nice oh, immersion cool. now. and uh, so i went to work to try to print these out well i tried to print them out at home and then i ran out of toner i was like oh man i can't you know wait for these things i've got to have my exapunk zines and so i went to work and i printed them out at work um and i got them back to my desk and i was like oh wait these are like it didn't it didn't flip them the right way so half the pages are upside down and so oops 
and so I'm like, well, maybe there's a problem with with a PDF, like Adobe PDF reader or whatever. Like it seems weird, but so I opened them in in uh, in Chrome, printed them out. Nope, same problem. Uh, it's apparently a problem with the printer, and so I just like I messed around with that part for probably an hour trying to figure out like what was wrong with the printer settings or anything. Couldn't figure it out, so I finally just flipped half the pages upside down and printed it out that way. Wow. That, you know, one of those weird moments where you have something that's like a hundred times harder than it should be. Yeah. Yeah. It was just, it was just baffling because there's the setting, there's a setting for like flip short edge, flip long edge. And I knew which it was supposed to be short edge, but either setting produced the same results. Like it didn't change anything in how it printed out. Oh, ouch. I know it's not a problem with the PDF because I printed them out just fine at home. You know, only like a few pages before I ran out of toner. So it was just like, oh, printer, why? So, such a straightforward operation. I mean, it's not, but it seems like it's such a straightforward operation. Life hack. Just use human blood. It's cheaper. <laughs> than toner. Yeah. I mean, I believe that actually is literally true. The cost of toner per ounce is greater than that of human blood or basically anything else. You use one of the most expensive liquids out there. Aside from, like, exotic elements. Oh, man. So, are you having any hard hardware problems these days? Uh, no. Uh, everything is good for me. I think, th I think we're done with my office. We moved in three months ago, but this week my birthday present arrived a month late. I mean, we knew it was <laughs> going to be a month late. Uh, you know, oh, okay. we, my wife got me a custom-built gaming chair. Again, this is, yeah, this is one of those things you think doesn't matter, but when you sit in the chair 14 hours a day, it really matters. And right. especially for the die cast, uh, my old chair, every time I shifted my weight, it would make this massive, like, I don't even know, like, popping sound. Like, is the, like, if you imagine there were two pieces of metal that would, like, rub past each other and make this pop when they finally, you know, break the tension and are freed from each other. And then you lean the other way and it does the same thing in the other, the other direction. And it was always it was like making a these mechanical spring in there that was going off center or something. Right. And it was so bad. It was like even the slightest movement would create this sort of groaning sound. Everything was noisy about this chair. Um, just awful noises constantly. So every time I did the die cast, I had to make sure that while I was talking, I was perfectly still. Because otherwise it would just be, you know, it would just sound like that. I mean, that was me banging my mic. But, you know, it would sound a lot like that, but with less echoing. Just the whole time. And you're like, what is that? And it was so annoying. There was nothing. I oiled every part of it ten times and cushioned it. And, and for all that, it was a really uncomfortable chair, too. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it was no. just so terrible. It was like sitting on plywood. It was awful. But I got this lovely new chair. And oh, I've never had a gaming chair before. So I didn't realize how good they could be. It's like, you know, high frame rate monitors. You're like, well... What I have is fine. Why would I want something better? And then you finally get it and you're like, oh, that's why. That's really good. <laughs> so I've got this lovely chair and it is so comfy and I'm so happy. Thank you to my wife for the lovely gift. Can we get a, a picture of it in the diecast? I, I don't see it I now, will, but um, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I will add a picture of it to the show notes for those of you who care. All right. It's one of those things it, that... The comforts that you don't know you're missing, but that make such a difference in how you can do your job. Right, and the thing is, now now I've tasted the fruit of a good chair. I'm never going to want to go back. When this chair breaks, I'm not going to want one of those, you know, $100 Walmart chairs. I'm going to want a gaming chair. Something that's <laughs> incredibly quiet with 10 different, you know, articulation buttons and levers and things to adjust its position just the way you want and good good firm cushions you know the cheap chairs that you know they're nice and soft when they're new but then six months later all the padding's just disintegrated and you're sitting on the just the cheap 
you know, particle board <laughs> that's underneath yeah, all of it. Yeah. The carriage bolts are sticking into your butt. Exactly. And now this thing is, is firm. This is not going to fall apart in six months. So, oh, it's just so nice. But I'm never going to want to go back. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like in Oxygen Included, which is another game I've been playing recently, where you've got, you start off with these low skill characters and they don't need any kind of like luxuries or whatever. But then as they get more and more skilled and, and more and more capable, uh, their, their environmental needs keep climbing as well. Like they want decorations and stuff. They're not happy to just sleep on the floor and eat dog food or whatever. Yeah, exactly. They need their their larvae compacted into bricks instead of just eating them squirming and raw. Right. Obviously, that's you know you got to do that. That's how I I won't eat my larvae, you know, separate anymore. They need to be bricks. I'm picky. <laughs> so apparently, this game was released like a year ago, and I just didn't. I wasn't aware. I was in the middle of, I was working at a pretty uh, intense job, and so it was kind of taking a lot out of me at work, and I was not feeling it for doing engineering-y type of stuff. Um, I, rem I remember you talking about that, like, oh, that's cute, but I think I'm done. Yeah, yeah, it's like, this is a lot of the stuff I'm doing at work all day, so uh, I, I, don't, I don't need that in my spare time. But uh, now I'm doing a different kind of design, and that's kind of freed up the part of my brain that's like, oh, pipes and pumps and things, cool. And uh, the kids asked me a few, uh, what's a few days ago, maybe the beginning of the week, they're like, we want you to play Oxygen Not Included. I don't know what got in their head, maybe they were playing it or something. But uh, right. we had a few evenings where we sat down and I played some of the some of the Oxygen Not Included, and it's, it's pretty fun. Since they released it, it's uh, it feels much more polished than when it was in Alpha. And... I mean, obviously, that's what you would hope, but uh, a lot of the, the mechanics that they added in and were trying out have been removed. Uh, a lot of stuff's been streamlined, and uh, yeah, it, it, seems like a, it seems like a very nice experience. I've been having a lot of fun with it. Nice. I, I've been meaning to go back to the game. I should have done that this, this, sun, this summer during the dry spell we had. Oh, yeah. We were kind of hoping that Kerbal Space Program 2 would have been out, but... Right? Yeah, but that's, like, pushed back the next year. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> there aren't even any previews coming out for it. Right. One of the funny things is, last year at E3, I remember laughing, ha ha, you know, Cyberpunk is coming out in March, but so is um, Watch Dogs Legion. Watch Dogs Legion's just gonna stop existing. There's no contest. But then they both got pushed back and they still wound up within a month of each other <laughs> but i think there's enough time for me to play through watchdogs before cyberpunk comes out so this is going to work out when is that coming out i believe watchdogs is late october and cyberpunk is mid november perfect well fun is there any other cool previews you've seen recently well, no, no cool previews. I have seen oh, no. one of the most unappealing previews ever. All right, so you remember my Spider-Man series I did, I think it was last year? Yeah, yeah. Well, they've got a follow-up game to it starring the Miles Morales Spider-Man. Ah, uh -huh. from Into the Multiverse. Right. And he, you know, he's got his own book in the world of comics. I mean, he's a big, he's a big deal, but this is kind of his first game. And th I forget how many minutes long the preview is, but it's not, um, let me, let, me just, let me just look, seven and a half minutes. And it starts with, oh, you know, the game designer coming out and being super excited to show off this game. Now, in my Spider-Man series, I had, like, had this list of nitpicks that I think they really need to... Like, I understand this stuff's hard. You didn't get it the first time. That's fine. These are the areas you need to work on for the next game to really make this a great franchise. And every single one of them is way, way worse now. <laughs> well, I mean, they're, they're boasting that it's way worse, so maybe it's right. way, way worse. <laughs> 
Right. I'm judging this based on what they're showing us. Now, anybody can throw back, you know, well, it's just a preview. You don't know if that's what the game's going to really be like. And that's true. But they showed off the preview get to get us to react to it. And so that's what I'm doing. This preview that they showed us was... I, I got anno annoyed because it looks awful. But I also got annoyed because everybody else seems so excited. Okay, so here's the deal. <laughs> right. And you're like, get off my lawn. Right. It opens with a cutscene of Miles and his friend. I can't remember his friend's name. Um, but the two of the the two of them are walking along the street and having a conversation. But there's absolutely no drama. It's all exposition. And it's like, really? Just a purely expositional cutscene to lead off your your, I mean, think about Hollywood trailers. They don't do that. They don't explain what characters, you know, the, they don't explain, well, how did this character get here? And how did we meet? And let's explain the backstory of this game. No, they introduce a villain and then they'll throw in some quotes highlighting the conflict. Like, oh, you can't beat this person, you know, that you once loved. Or, oh, this guy is more powerful than then people understand or you know something to explain to us what the drama is going to center around right right oh. why we care about this situation that we're being thrust into right it, they will tell us look captain america and iron man are going to fight you don't spend the trailer explaining what was captain america doing in the last six months between movies no you like what are we going to see <laughs> What should we be excited about? And so that was a weird creative choice. I mean, it was a very boring cut. I mean, it's not a terrible cutscene. It's just an odd thing to lead off with. And you wouldn't be surprised if there was a cutscene like that in a 10 hour long game, because you have to have downtime somewhere. Sure. And you have to have exposition somewhere. But in this gem, supposedly, of a, of a trailer, you want to put your best material in there. And it's just like, that was that made the cut how <laughs> right, exactly the, why was this in particular the thing you wanted to show especially since it wasn't really needed for the later scenes they showed us so after that we get to see our enemies or at least some enemies from the game now in the last one they had the i want to call them stag um from but that's saints row the third the generic space marine assholes that you have to fight by the dozen. Oh, uh, yeah, the, the Silver Sable's sa goons. Right, the Sable goons. The, okay, those guys are gone, and now we have two different groups of space marines that are, you know, decked out in Tron red on one side and Tron blue on the other. So it's okay. like, wow, we took... Are they, took are they these, fighting each other? Are there, are yes, there light cycles? Fighting. No, that would be too cool. It's just guys with what? guns that are in very similar looking space marine armor that's color coded. And so I'm Do like, bullets well, leave behind trails of light and like go in, in right angle zigzags. <laughs> no, they just have bang bang guns. And that was also like really this is our enemy or this is the enemy you want to show off the last game showed off in its trailer the entire sinister six and i thought whoa you guys are showing off too much and now this one is like hey look remember the most boring part of the last game well we doubled the amount of boring enemies you have <laughs> right right we last game was a bowl of oatmeal with raisins but now we've taken out the raisins. <laughs> so that's not exciting. And then Miles jumps into the fray. Oh no, they're fighting each other. It's going to do some, you know, it's going to destroy the city. So he jumps in. And in a cutscene, the, the other thing I hated about Spider Man, the original, is the constant cutscene incompetence where Spider Man would like stop having spider sense and just get pancaked and ambushed and backstabbed and stand around talking instead of like doing things as the main character and then the bad right, guys would right. steamroll him 
and it just twirled yeah. me up a wall. Well, this cutscene like, was like in when you're in gameplay, you're all like jumping in the air and flying around and swinging on stuff and kicking guys, and then in cutscenes, it's all banana peels and slide whistles. Right, and it's like. Don't make the main character incompetent. Make the bad guys clever. You know, they shoot a rocket at him. He, like, jumps up in the air, grabs the rocket, and whips it back at them. And you're thinking, yeah, but then he, actually, when he jumps up in the air, it's into a trap somehow. You know, they've got, they knew he was going to jump up in the air, and they had something planned for that. Then you're like, okay, these guys are a step ahead of him. And not like, he just stands there and takes it on the chin. I mean, these were like, he's taking hits from people that you don't need spider sense to see the attack coming. This giant Major League Baseball wind-up swing before he hits Spider-Man. And Spider-Man just stands there and takes it on the chin. Like, what are you doing? Are you like texting somebody in the middle of this fight how are you that distracted the guy's right in front of you how did you not see that coming <laughs> so just like all of this calm uh, cutscene incompetence against boring enemies but then they finally after all that they get to the the combat and i'm looking for you know the normal melee combat throw dudes around with web them up but instead, Miles starts using all these nuke powers, like he's a wizard now. Again, what? this was my... This was my gripe with the previous game. It's like, oh, this combat's pretty unforgiving. Oh, it's really like, wow. These are just a few goons. And I'm having... Oh, wait. If I just pause the game and open up the weapon wheel and switch to one of these overpowered weapons and hit the button, and now everybody's instantly neutralized. So it's like the game is sort of frustrating and not very rewarding if you play it just using the melee mechanics. But then you've got all of these powers that are thematically wrong and way too overpowered. And it's like, I want to like, get... He's got Batman's utility belt. And you're like, what? where did that come from? And why? And isn't Batman going to come and, like, asking for it back? <laughs> right. It's like Batman's utility belt if Batman had powers that, like, affected an entire city block or something. Just, like, instantly web up everybody within 20 meters of you. And it's like, well... Oh. But then why would I ever stop to punch anybody? Why would I ever engage with the core mechanics when I can just uh, pause the game? Or it goes, <laughs> actually goes into stu super slow-mo mode, roll around to the next power, use that one, neutralize a bunch of people, and then do that again and again and again. You know, your, your powers recharge over time. So you can just rotate through them. But that means constantly breaking the flow of combat. And it's just a really boring way, and it doesn't look like Spider-Man. And this game's even worse. Um, in the comics, Miles has that um, Venom Strike ability that lets him stun one person. And now, in this cutscene, or no, this was gameplay, he just had this thing where he did, like, Venom Strike, you know, everything within 10 meters around him. Just this giant yellow fireball explosion of, t of stun powers. It's like, that's... That's a bit much for a brand new Miles Spider-Man. And it sort of, again, negates the need for the brawling mechanics. And I know it, during gameplay, that'll be just like a stop to open the weapon wheel and switch to the next overpowered thing. Just awful, awful, awful. I remember he has that, but he it, that's like a breakthrough for him and he does it once or, or maybe twice. Like, it's not right. like he can just do it all the time, right? Right. No, I think in the comics he can do it all the time, but that's something he works up to. And this game's just going to hand him this overpowered version of that right I mean, from unless the start. Unless you were watching the ending battle or something, which it would also felt be like weird the, for them to show off. It felt like it was the first time he was meeting these two groups of space marines. Hmm. Now, again, maybe... This is just, they took some creative liberties and, you know, took the end game powers and gave it to him at the beginning of the game to show off all their cool combat mechanics. But even then, it's like, that doesn't look like fun. Ugh. 
And it's just like, well, why do, you, why do you need input from me? I'll just set up a macro and put the controller down and go make a sandwich while Spider-Man just nukes everybody to death. <laughs> Flies up in the air, called, casts Knights of the Round four times, and, and then are <laughs> like, you're done. Oh, man. And then it all ends with a... Ma as if I was already, like, at the end of my patience. Like, this is everything I hated about the original that I wanted them to fix, and it looks way worse. And then it ends with a massive... I don't know that I've ever seen a QuickTime sequence this long. I mean, it just felt like it went on forever. And you, it's just a cutscene where he, like... Oh no, Pete, the bridge is falling apart. And it's like, okay, we've had Spider-Man web up a lot of bridges recently. And I just felt like... Yeah, it okay, seems like it's kind of becoming a thing now. Right, like he's part bridge engineer these days. And he's saving cars falling off the bridge and doing all this stuff. And I felt like, okay, this has been done to death. And I'm not participating. I'm just hitting the square. And they looked really... Con really forgiving so it's like it's not even a test of skill it's just hit this button to not reset the cutscene that you're watching yeah if they had some sort of like spider-man themed world of goo kind of puzzle where you could like build a whole bridge out of spider-man webs or something that'd be that'd be kind of cool <laughs> right <laughs> right so that was i mean this was like my 2018 game of the year and I think I'm going the the follow up is going to drive me absolutely bonkers. This looks awful, but people are into it, so I don't know. I don't know where the rest of this industry is going. It makes me crazy. So how are you? Well, what else is going on with you, Paul? You know what makes me crazy? Okay, what? so I've been trying to register my car. I, I bought a, a van, and I'm trying to get the title transferred. And normally, this would be a thing where you, like, walk into the DMV, you go up to the counter, you give the people the paper, and they're like, great, we'll give you a temporary title, and your title will arrive in two weeks or whatever. Sure. Um, but instead, this is, like, one of those things where I started this process back in June. Wait, what? And uh, it's still, I just got notification today that it was like, success, we're going to mail you your title. Because like, so the first thing is that I did it online because you can't go into the DMV because all the DMVs in California are closed. I don't know what it's like over there, but like California is just like no DMVs for anyone. And so you mail the thing in. Okay. Um, but before you mail it in, you have to, so you have to go online, you have to do, fill out the form online, you say, really seriously, I'm going to do this, and everyone signed it, yes, absolutely, and, you know, here's my signature, whatever, and, you know, apply for the form. And then they send you uh, a, a response email. But the state of California sends out so many of these response emails that all of the email programs think that they are junk, and so they end up in your junk box. And then <laughs> oh, no. you don't see them. And then they send you a follow-up email that also ends up in your junk box, but you, like, while you're cleaning out your junk box, you see it, and it's like, oh, okay, well, and then it's like, this is your final warning, you need to respond, or we're canceling your thing. And it's like, what? What What do you mean? Final, I didn't have seen any of this. And so I get it out, I'm like, no, junk box is not junk, this is from the state of California, it's got a go .gov at the end of the email address, like, come on, they don't send out spam, I mean, maybe they do, who knows. So... So I'm trying to figure out, like, okay, how to fill out this thing. So I mail in the title, and then they, like, I don't know, do nothing for a month. And then it arrives back, and it's like, they mail it back to me. And they're like, you didn't have all the forms. Send us more forms or something. And so then I email them about it, and they never email me back. And then I looked at my junk folders, and, oh, yeah, actually, they did email me back, and I went in the junk folder again. <laughs> it's like, oh, oh, this drives me absolutely crazy. It, for As an aside, I have this same problem. I get an email every week about backups to my website, and I want to download them. I want the backups on my machine, not up on the server, because that way, if something happens to the server, I've got it. But it always, always, always 
throws it in spam. This looks like spam. And I say, it is not spam. Next week, this looks like spam. It's not friggin' spam. It's coming from my domain. It's good. But it will never, ever, ever learn. It will always throw it into spam and has to be fished out. And this is Gmail I'm talking about. And so I hate that these machines can't be, these systems can't be adjusted or learn, especially whitelisting something and saying it's not spam is just, it should never go into spam again. Makes me crazy. Yeah. I'm sorry. Continue with your story. Yeah, well, well, that's, yeah, that's, that's most of the story. It's just, oh, I don't understand how I can keep putting him into spam. Like the first time, sure. I, whatever, like. I'm sure that um, there's a bunch of people that are like, this is spam, I don't want this, when it's really something they need. Fair enough. But, like, it's something that I actually need, and I want it. And why are you throwing it in junk mail over and over again? So, anyway, finally got that all sorted out. And then uh, I got a, a thing from the DMV in the mail today about my driver's license is expiring, and so you have to go online and, like, fill out the driver's license thing. And that was all pretty straightforward, except that in the in the thing where they're like, "How tall are you?" and it's got two little fields, and they've got like up and down arrows, and they start they both start at zero. And so just for fun, because I'm playing Exapunks, I'm like, "Oh, well, it's, I'll just click down." Like, is can I click down from zero? Ha ha ha! Yes, actually, you can. You can click down, and it'll it'll put a negative number in the field. Why? Why is that even an option? Why is it not clamped? I like. And I, you can just hold it down, and it'll just keep going down. It'll go past negative 100 feet tall. How tall are you? Less than negative 100 feet? That's fine. Go for it. <laughs> you're not a height challenge. You're like the <laughs> Euclidean geometry challenged. Like, you exist in some <laughs> impossible space. You are a crater in the ground. <laughs> A sapient crater that wants a driver's license. Sure. And, and so it's got a feet field and like, okay, it's unclamped, it's feet, like maybe you're a thousand feet tall. I don't know. The DMV doesn't know. But then it's got an inches field. Inches is clear. It should be from zero to 12. You can't have more than 12 inches. You shouldn't have more than 11. It should be from zero to 11 inches. But no, inches is unclamped. You could have negative inches and negative feet and it could be less than 17 negative inches of tall. Like, why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> so that tickled me. That is hilarious. Uh, you've got a screenshot here in the show notes. I will, I will put it, I will put it in the show in the post in case anybody wants to see this hilarity. That's amazing. So, uh, in more in more fun stuff, the computer games. I've been playing Stormworks. Uh, it's like a so you know how like after Minecraft came out, maybe like a year or two after Minecraft, there were all those games where you could like build stuff out of cubes. There was a, a couple of spaceship games where you could build stuff out of cubes. Yeah, yeah. Most there of was, like, them Robo not Craft. Good. Yeah, yeah. There were a few robot games. You build robots out of cubes. Um, Siege, Siegecraft, Siege, Siege Works or something. Yeah, and I I vaguely remember remember that. There were a few games like that where it's just like. It didn't really. It wasn't. It wasn't deep enough. There wasn't deep enough simulation going on to make it interesting. To make an interesting challenge, and uh, and then there was Kerbal Space Program, which is kind of like it wasn't really cubes put together. I mean, you could do some amount of arbitrary building, but it was more physics based. It had a lot more simulation and some deeper systems. It wasn't quite deep enough, but you were trying to do something specific and right. and something real. And it was like, okay, this is a lot. This is a lot better. And um, so Stormworks feels like it has hit. Now, I haven't played it very long. It's only been a couple hours. But it feels like it's hitting the, the, the sweet spot for complexity and simulation happening. There's like multiple different resources. And um, so, so the game is that you build, customize, and then pilot uh, mostly boats, but also helicopters and planes and, and trucks and things in order to do rescue rescue works. So it's like in a storm or whatever, you try to go out and rescue people, their boats flipped over, caught on fire or something. I love the artwork. I'm I'm looking at the page on Steam now and I absolutely love this artwork. It looks like it's flat shaded. I, I I don't think it is. I think it's just a shader designed to create this effect, but I love it. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty. Uh it's it seems to be like I said, it seems to be hitting the sweet spot for like simulation and uh and systems and things and there's you know there's 
engines and fuel and you have to connect them all up you know like space engineers space engineers i feel like was almost the closest to to this kind of thing yes yeah space engineers i loved the idea of space engineers but the needing to weld every cube and then weld more to put like a cover on it so it's not just a frame it just made everything take so long and after being spoiled by minecraft yeah. where you just put down a cube at a time uh space engineers i think they were trying to make it more immersive but it just made the pace feel glacial but i loved everything else about it it was just really cool so this feels like that kind of system except even more so because they've got all these programming things inside it so you can you can make you can make a circuit board that goes in your vessel and then like inside the circuit board you can do all this programming to program all the inputs and outputs and how they relate to each other and stuff like that and then it all gets like compressed down into this one component so you don't have to do you know like redstone wiring in minecraft or you have this giant scrolling right. thing to do something simple it compresses all that down so you can do something complex and something tiny and it's just like oh it's great it's great i love it and they've got power and but you don't actually have to run the wires you just in in a schematic mode you're just like connect this thing to that thing you're done and it's just it's great i like it i like it a lot and then very you're doing cool. stuff that's actually very very down to earth i mean it's in, in the ocean and stuff and uh the simulation isn't too deep but it's deep enough to be interesting and uh yeah i've been having a lot of fun with it very cool it looks great uh, I'll, maybe I'll post a one of the trailers in the show notes. I love this flat shaded style. I just dig it so much. Oh, and then the editing tools are are great because you you edit it in an editor, and then you just like when your your vehicle's in your bay or whatever, you go into the editor and it's just like edit it all. You know, you don't have to weld it or whatever. And then in the field, you can get out your welder and like fix stuff manually. But for editing and creating vessels and stuff, it's all just, you know, drag and drop and they've got symmetry axes and all that stuff. Nice. What do you say we do some mailbags? Yeah, we got some time. Um, I don't know how to start reading this one because it doesn't start with Dear Diecast. I'm trapped in a loop. I just, I'm, st I'm trapped in a while loop looking for the open. Okay, I'm going to just tr read this. And I'll pretend that they said Dear Diecast. Here go this is very difficult for me. In, okay. in honor of no Dear Diecast, in on I can't I can't start without saying that. In honor of the publication of Sid uh, Meyer's memoirs, it there's a it's the word memoirs with an exclamation mark on the end. I believe that's part of the title. A book a book of uh, Sid Meyer's memoirs. I must ask, do you ever read books about video games or video gaming? If so, what are some of your favorites? Mine is You, a novel about game development and the history of game development by Austin Grossman. John, thank you for the question. Um, the only book I've read is um, Masters of Doom. That was a really good book, though. <laughs> Uh, Masters of Doom is the story of, one, the creation of Doom, two, kind of id software in general, and three, the um, rift, the eventual rift between Carmack and Romero. Um, John Carmack and John Romero, the rift between that grew between those guys and kind of how that era of the company ended. And that was such a good book. Oh, I also read Zero Effect, um, which was actually made me kind of uncomfortable. Um, that was autobiographical. Oh, no, wait, not... I, I, I correct myself, not Zero Effect. That was a 90s movie. Significant Zero um, by Walt Williams. The, Walt Williams somehow got himself a job at... Um, 2k games as a games analyst basically and this should have been an executive position but instead it was held by this 20 something kid um who using that position would go into would go into 
some of the subsidiaries of 2K Games, and ostensibly his goal was to guide projects, right? Oh, we think this is a bad decision. And some of, sometimes he was right. It was the classic case of the writer is absolute turbo garbage, and nobody on the team is willing to challenge them, and Walt would come in and and you know call them out on basically oh wow you are writing super cringe you are writing this because it's self-gratifying this is not going to be entertaining for people and walt was right right, right. i mean author insert other, fanfic kind of stuff yeah like one person had this one political thing that they thought was real important to them and was like muscling it into this game where it really just would not fit and it would just be the most cringy, soapboxy thing, right? Yeah. And Walt Williams would come in, but he also just sort of in, inserted himself and, and would hassle the other creators. And he's you know, telling this story autobiographically and really sort of trying to change their creative vision just by swinging his weight around instead of, you know, persuading people here's why I think your idea is is going to have problems, or here's here's what critics are going to say if you choose this. Mm, right. Um, he was very heavy-handed, and it made me not like him. And I don't like to say that about people, but the book itself is absolutely fascinating. And it was sort of just exhibit A in my ongoing thesis that the people running these games companies don't know what they're doing and it's crippling them. Like, this kid knew more than any of his bosses. And so they hired him to come in and keep an eye on their projects. But this kid also had no idea how to work with artists, work towards compromise, persuade people that his his opinion was best, offer constructive criticism. He just sort of came in um, with a sledgehammer off often. And, oh, it just, it just hurt to read. But it was a really fascinating book. Hmm. Wow. So those are my two favorites. <clears throat> Meaning the only two, I think two I... books I've, re I've read on gaming. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, there's also Ready Player One, right? I've never read it. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I actually kind of found the. I read some passages of it, and I actually found it super irritating. Like it just would. Oh yeah, it was definitely irritating. <laughs> just this uh, catalog of nostalgia properties, and it felt like some some nerd's wish list for their nerd den. And I'm like, oh, this would be a cool room to sit around in, but I don't need you an itemized list of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it was kind of, uh, well, you know, it was a first novel, so give him some slack. I can't criticize him too much then if that's your first, you know, my first novel sold a few thousand copies and his first novel got made into a Steven Spielberg movie, so maybe I should just shut up. <laughs> Oh no, my uh, the, the only serious game book that I've read is uh, Art of Game Design: A Book of Lenses by Jesse Shell, and that was quite a, a tome to work through. What was it in, in terms of uh, a book of lenses? It's it's basically um, when was it published? I think it was the mid aughts. Um, it was like the the textbook, the go-to textbook for game design, you know, a decade and a half ago. And uh, I, I actually read through it and then did a, a podcast um, summarizing the chapters together with a friend of mine, Andy Wilkinson. And we did uh, did kind of, you know, talking point over each of the lenses that he has in the book. It's a hundred lenses. And um, I actually have a, oh, I have a, a spreadsheet I can I can put in the show notes. Uh, so that was that was pretty fun, but I don't think I think I did read Masters of Doom also uh, some years ago, but not really like history of gaming. It's not it's either something that everyone has done for so long that it's almost difficult to put a box around it, 
Or if you're talking about like video gaming specifically, it's something that no one has done for long enough to really even draw any trend lines. Hmm. Yeah. Another book I've always wanted to read is Game Feel by Steve Swink. And that's just it's not on history of games, it's on game design. But it's on how make you know, how do you make games feel kinesthetically pleasing? I find that to be a fascinating like anytime I see any video come up on YouTube about it. And the only two I know of that are really great is one from Game Maker's Toolkit and one from Errant Signal. I just love this topic, but I haven't gotten the book because it, it, it's not a big book. This is not a massive um, textbook. This is, I'm pretty sure, a small paper bag. A paper bag. It's a small paper bag. Paperback. <laughs> Could you imagine if a stumbled mouth like me tried to run a podcast? That would be so embarrassing. Um, <laughs> it's not a big paperback, but you can't get it for less than 60 bucks. And that's what Oof. it starts at. Yeah. Um, oh, you can get it used. Uh, yeah, the price comes all the way down to $46 if you're willing to get it used. A used yeah. paperback. See, that's what I'm talking about. Like, th the classics of the genre are not even out of copyright yet, and so you can't get a free copy of it and just absorb the material. Like, it's it's so, such a young medium. Right. And, I mean, even if you get the Kindle version with zero printing costs, it's $45. How? And, yeah. I, I just refuse to buy that makes me angry when I see it. I'm like, I'm sure it's a good book, but you know, screw you. I'm not paying that for a freaking Kindle book. Like, if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want to spend forty five dollars on a small um you know, ebook. That's just absolutely outrageous. Yeah, you'd pay someone a hundred bucks an hour to go down to the local library transcribe it for you and then <laughs> right. write it out on parchment before you'd pay them the $45. Right, exactly. Yeah, it's the principle of the thing. Like, how dare you? And this is, you know, I also really have a shortage of patience for the for this because it's an educational book. And I'm sure that's why it's so much. This is probably a textbook in some co course in a game college. And so... It's being paid for by people's tuition money, and so that just drives the price up, right? They know, hey, these kids yeah, have got a bunch of tuition money. It, so, yeah. Yeah. The kids aren't spending their money, quote-unquote. They're spending their future money, and that's totally different. <laughs> They're spending their, their student loans that they'll have to pay back for the rest of their lives. Ugh. It's it's tragic. Um, even renting it is eight fifty. A rental what? of a digital you book. You can't rent a digital book. That's that's got to be a crime, right? It's piracy. Uh, <laughs> it really yeah, is. So I've never, yeah, I've never, um, I've never read this book. I've always wanted to, and I keep coming back every couple years. Hey, has this? book moved down into sane area? No? Never mind. I don't want it, and now I'm angry at you. And I'm sure it's not Steve Swink's fault. I'm sure this is the publisher, like I said. You know, oh, these kids have got to buy the book to pass the class, so why lower the price? Um, I was going to read the next diecast mailbag question, but it also yeah. fails the keyword test. Right? Like, how do you even begin reading an email that doesn't start with Dear Diecast. It's impossible. All right, I'm going to give it a shot. Here we go. All right, good luck. <coughs> Seamus, when you write these long series, Jedi Fallen Order, do you get some satisfaction when you see people talking about something in the comments that you've already written an in-depth piece on and it's coming down the pipeline? Thomas. And to be fair to Thomas, this wasn't originally a Diecast question for the mailbag. This was a comment on your blog. So... This is fascinating because when I read this one in the queue, I don't always see what post it's attached to, right? I see the email first and then I have to look all the way to the far right to see what comment, what post this comment is to. And so 
when I started to read this, I was like, oh, yes, he's this is definitely a comment on my programming series. And then it was Jedi Fallen Order, and I was like, oh, yeah. So there's a big difference here between the two. But yes, I absolutely feel so clever when somebody makes some comment about the game and I'm like, Pfft, I've got an entire, you know, half a post, a thousand words on this coming up two weeks from now. And I'm like, yes, they, it gives me, it, it's not that it makes me feel prescient. It makes me feel good that I correctly anticipated what people would say in response or ask in response. I have read the opinions correctly and have addressed people's concerns or have spotted things that were bothering other people, right? Makes me feel like I'm doing a good job. Yeah, yeah. It's like an engineer who's who's like engineered something and then they take it for review and they're like, oh, but what about this factor? What if they drop it on the ground? And you're like, aha, but I've accounted for that. Right, yes. That's exactly the feeling. The The stress test where you already anticipated all the problems and dealt with them ahead of time. However, I get the exact opposite feeling during programming posts. Like when somebody criticizes it, hey, you know, I don't like the way you're doing this and this doesn't seem like a very good idea. And I know three weeks from now, um, I'm going to address this and fix it all up. And then people will say, oh, that's so much better. But now it's going to be three weeks of people saying, oh, I really don't like that. I really don't like it. I think you've made a bad call here. <laughs> or I don't understand your thinking here. And that drives you crazy. Like, that makes me absolutely... And it's nobody's fault. I mean, it's not like they're trying to annoy me. They're just giving their honest feedback. But it, it's still frustrating. And it makes right. me more, it, well, and it's fresh. And usually you're when you're doing a retrospective on a game, you and the audience are together criticizing the property that, you know, the, whatever this this third party made. But when you're doing a programming post, it's it's you and the audience criticizing something that you are making yourself. Yes. And then, in fact, I know so and I'm going to have to listen to that criticism until we get to the part where I deal with it. And, yeah, yeah, that makes it really hard. It makes me want to spoil my own series. No, 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 here in part six, I'm going to do this other thing and it'll fix that and this other problem. Don't worry about it. Like, that would just sort of like, after five of those comments, everybody will feel like they've read the whole dang thing and there'll be no reason to continue. <laughs> So do you ever run across things when you're doing a programming series where someone will be like, oh, why are you doing that way? That's dumb. You should do this other thing. And that is something you haven't addressed and it like solves a bunch of problems and you kind of feel sheepish about not knowing about it? Yeah, once in a while, but those hurt less. I mean, there's always the embarrassment that I didn't do a perfect job, but since you're learning something, it feels like, okay, that's, I, I got some knowledge in return. It's not just that, you know, um... You know, if you've ever you seen the knew Office, the answer. Yeah. Right. If you've ever seen The Office and somebody comes to the main character and talks to him about, we're putting cover sheets on the TPS reports now. And he's like, okay, I'll do that. And then like six other people come to him and tell him the same thing. And by the end, he's just at his wit's end. That's how it feels when people are sort of criticizing things I'll deal with. It's like, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. Okay. <laughs> right. Right. But again, it's nobody's fault. It's not that people are trying to annoy me. I mean, that's like an inescapable thing that happens when you, you know, tell this story a bit at a time. The other way I could fix it is just post the entire project in one monolithic post, and then nobody would read it. And then it'd be like documentation. Right? <laughs> just write documentation, and that sucks. Nobody wants to write documentation. All right. That would be an um, interesting programming series to like release the code at the beginning of the series and then just like release the documentation in pieces. <laughs> Have everybody going crazy at the beginning. I don't understand any of this. How can I do this? And they have to wait six weeks for the part they're interested in to be documented so they know what they're dealing with. Oh, it'd be just like an open source project. Yes. <laughs> Welcome to the world of open source. All right, we're technically 
um, at the end of our time, but I want to do one more. Hi there. I am playing through Outer Worlds, and I have noticed that it makes me feel a little claustrophobic. At first I thought it was a level design, but then I thought maybe the player height was different or the models were too big, but I couldn't put but I can't put my finger on it. Do you have any idea why this game might feel smaller? Even the outdoor locations feel small. Thanks. Rob Lundine. Thank you for the question. So I'll bet this is something you've dealt with, Paul, as well. Anybody that does 3D modeling has to work out scale as perceived by humans and sooner or later yeah. you're gonna you're gonna run into that problem where you make a model it looks fantastic then you stick it into the game or the tech demo that you're making and you get in there and that that couch that you thought you know looked just right it actually feels like a little children's toy couch and it comes up to your shins or something it comes up to thigh height. Right. To, your, like, to your knees, which is how high a couch really is in real life, but it doesn't feel right for some reason. Oh, I was thinking the back of the couch came up to, like, your thigh. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, that's that's another thing. Um, yeah, well, you go ahead with your point. Well, yeah, so, so one of the things that's really difficult with games is that they're almost always stylized. You almost never have a game that's just realistic scale on everything. Right, absolutely. They're especially doorways. Oh my goodness. Doorways in games are friggin' enormous compared to the real world. Because, and I've run into the, in fact, I ran into this during this project. I had doors that were a meter wide. Now that's a wide door. Yeah. By, that's like a, a by, front door. Right. Um, that's a nice wide door. You can get appliances through there. But it felt... So, it, I had the camera set so that you were average human height, which is, I think, like 1.6 meters to 1.8, depending on, you know, male, female, whatever. You know, that that's like the range of human heights that you'll typically see. Sure. With 1.8 being a, an above average height and like 1.6 being below. But somewhere in that ballpark and I had the camera height at that and the doors felt so narrow that it actually felt annoying trying to get through them like you had to line yourself up just right or every time you went through the door you would drag against the you know hit your shoulder on the on the edge of the door going in um, which does sometimes happen in in real life if you're like right. half asleep and and hung over and stumbling in the dark trying to get a drink of water or get to the toilet or something Right. And in a game, of course, like, imagine how much trouble you'd have getting through doors if you were wearing blinders all the time that narrowed your vision to, like, 80-degree field of view, which is typical for video games. Like, it would, you would want and, things and to be nice and you could feel your wide. legs, and you had one eye covered, so you don't have any depth perception. <laughs> right? Yes. Yeah, so one eye, 80 degrees, uh, field of view a numb body and lots of things are just sort of slightly in different scales and you're riding um, around on a remote control wheelchair <laughs> you're riding atop a Roomba yeah yeah so I had uh, quite a bit of this problem back in the late 90s because active worlds I mean when you're making 3d models you want to work in in metric system working in imperial units would just be crazy you want to design your game world around a nice tidy grid um to just make it easier on your no programmer wants to implement an imperial system as the coordinates in a video game <laughs> that would just be horrific so i i had to get comfortable with the metric system and like by comfortable i don't need like Getting the grasping centimeters, meters, um, kilometers, that's easy conceptually. But the intuitive understanding is actually very slow to come. Like, how many meters tall is a coffee table? Uh, right. <laughs> right. 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 And I, I'd get, like, one thing, like, um, human height. Okay, I'd look that up and then go, well... 
Okay, so a fridge. Maybe I'm making a fridge this week. I don't know why I'd make a fridge. But let's say I'm making a fridge this week. Uh, that's a little bigger than a human, so maybe that'd be two meters big. And then I'd build a two meter tall refrigerator and I'd go in and, whoa, what is this thing? <laughs> this is gigantic piece of machinery that towers over me so much. And I'm like, uh, you know, getting all those little, getting a feel for what the size of things should be, especially if you're working in a program like Blender that, you know, doesn't want you to clutter up the scene with them. Um, a bunch of other objects like the workflow going from blender to unity it doesn't want you to store all the objects in the scene even though that would help you get the sizes right yeah true and it, one of the things that i've run into with modeling for reality is reference photos you get like you get a reference photo of the thing you're trying to model and then you get a dimension off it. I, I have a tape measure that's got centimeters and meters on it. And I just like stick that thing up there and measure the dang thing. Because you can guess at it all day long and you'll be wrong all day long. And it's just yes. it's not worth the hassle. <laughs> it never even occurred to me to measure stuff in the real world. But I was stuck in this stupid office. And the stuff I was modeling wasn't office desks and chairs and monitors. <laughs> so I was kind of stuck for measurements. Like, uh, if we ever need... A office cubicle. Uh, I'm set. <laughs> but no, right, it's right. always like... But then even if you get the dimensions right, like say you, you nail it down, if you're putting it in a game that's got an art style, like like Outer Worlds is art deco. It isn't... You're not going to find an art deco anything it's just sitting around. Like it's right. hard to find reference for that stuff. And since everything's stylized, it's also a little bit off dimension. The, the big things are maybe a little bit smaller, the small things are maybe a little bit bigger, or maybe they're way smaller so that they fit in your hand. And, and like, there's a lot of factors into how the stylization affects the scale and positioning and, and distribution of objects. And so you're fighting against both the difficulty of intuitively understanding how big things really should be and the difficulty of understanding how that translates into the style of the game that you're working in. Yeah, and there are some places where you can't reconcile it. Like, okay, this place needs to be photorealistic, but, you know, we're making some Call of Duty shooter, you know, where you're going to go house to house shooting terrorists or whatever. You know, and... yeah. I'm thinking of something like Homefront, where you're in domestic spaces, where the audience is familiar with the sizes of things, but you need more room. The typical player model doesn't, you know, keep track of your legs as independent collision boxes so that you can, you know, step over this end table if it gets in your way. You are, as we've said in previous episodes, a capsule sliding around in a level. And so that means for most living room setups, you can't fit in between the coffee table and the couch. <laughs> so we have to right. expand. Yeah. So we have to expand those distances and we have to make the doors bigger. But we need everything else to feel the right size. And that means you're going to have this super wide front door with these normal sized pieces of furniture that are just a little further apart than feels correct. Like, wow, these folks really sit back from the TV. And from the coffee table, right. how do they even use that? <laughs> like you'd lean forward, drop your drink, and it would just hit the floor about a <laughs> about a foot away from the coffee table. Oh, there I am dropping yeah, into yeah. imperial units again. Um, this is something that I was yeah. actually impressed with in a Stormworks. Stormworks. Uh, it seems like the collision model is actually sm quite small. It's like like a half meter wide. And so you can fit in gaps that you wouldn't normally be able to in a in a conventional video game, which is I was impressed by. Yeah, in the case to to take this back to Outer Worlds, I I felt the same thing that the ship was quite claustrophobic. Um, I think it's just a reasonably sized ship, like they didn't allow for that extra convenient space. They just made it as big as, you know, as if they were making a movie set. Hmm, right. With, without, allow, without allowing for a 
player model, which means it feels incredibly narrow by video game standards. You know, if you were making a vi if you're making a movie about you know people on a summer, you're making Hunt for Red October. You, you're not going to make your set like super wide mall corridors. <laughs> no, you're going to keep that claustrophobic feel that's important to the movie. But you might want to you might want to nudge that outward if it's a video game and the player is trying to actually navigate the the space. Um yeah, so Outer Worlds I think I think also if I remember correctly, the Outer Worlds the corridors were a little boxy. They needed to like make it more like a submarine, you know, not a round tube passage, but like have those little beveled corners or I don't know what you'd call that where it looks like you know Chamfered. it's not a square ball well, it's what chamfered it's like a 45 degree yeah. angle on all the corners yeah yes yes that's the I can never remember that word um yeah beveled fact, is whole, rounded and chamfered is is uh hard corners I also get bevels and bezels confused oh yeah don't confuse those um, uh, so another thing that I noticed on Outer Worlds, I've never played Outer Worlds, but I was watching in some playthrough game footage, and something that I've noticed is that they've got a, a pretty noticeable depth of field on it, where the the camera like automatically decides where it thinks that you're looking, and then kind of blurs things in the background. And right. uh, for whatever reason, they they put that in there, and maybe it's because like it was a technical thing that they could do, and they were excited about it. But the, what that does is it makes it look like the lens that you are capturing the scene with is very large compared to the scene. So like if you ever see tilt focus uh, miniatures or something like that, yes, it yeah, goes yeah. out of focus really quickly because the lens is so big compared to the size of the models. So if you've got a really strong depth of field in a game, it's going to make it feel like it's all miniature because the, what you're looking through is supposedly big. It makes it look like your eyes are these huge things that are... You know that are trying to focus on these objects that are very close to you and very small yeah it's great for making you know we have the same problem with scale in the outdoors in the real world you can see dozens of miles to the horizon but in a video game you know it's usually like half a mile right but we want it to look like you have this vast distance and Depth of field is a good way of just, oh, look how blurry that is. That must be incredibly far away, your brain tells you. And that's really good for <laughs> hiding for hiding the, the limited size of game worlds. Right, except that it's not correct. Like, when you go right. outside, if you're focusing on something that's like 20 meters away, it's going to be... In, it's going to be crystal clear and so will a mountain 20 miles away like 20 meters and 20 right. miles are basically the same they're basically infinite both of them are basically infinitely far away as far as your eyeballs are concerned right. yeah, and so if you want to get eyeballs. depth yeah if you want to get depth in a world put a little bit of atmospheric haze in there and that'll hit that scale for you but don't blur it because then it makes it look like a miniature set right and well it's i think it's trying to it's trying to imitate cinema where usually that's a deliberate choice that the cinematographer makes is I want the thing that I'm looking at with the camera to be in sharp focus and I want the stuff in the background to be blurry to draw the audience's eye to the sharp and focus thing to say this this is the part of the scene I need you to be looking at yeah and that's makes sense in a movie but in a video game the camera is my face and I control yes. where it points. And so I think, I think at the very least you should never have things closer than like a hundred meters go out of focus. Like that's just a disaster that just frustrates you. You, you look out ahead at the tree in the distance and it's so blurry and it's like, it, no, even in a movie that would be in sharp focus. This is way too much. It's too strong. And I want to yeah. see the tree clearly. My my computer... Right. If it had eye tracking, then it would be great, because then it could right. see where you are actually looking and focus on that. But it's just guessing at what you want to look at, and it, most of the time it's going to be wrong. Right. And, and for me, it also frustrates me, frustrate, ugh, frustrates me the waste of processing power. My computer spent all this 
power to draw that tree and all its leaves in pixel perfect accuracy. And then we're going to spend this massive additional power to throw all that away and blur it all together. It's like, <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, how much of this of my graphical pod? Like, oh, look, I have 40 frames a second. Can I turn off depth of field? N you know, if I can, I'm, you know, that might get up to 60 because depth of field, depth of field and motion blur are friggin' expensive. Um, yeah, and, and you can turn it off in Outer Worlds if you're willing to get elbows deep in INI &I files. Yeah, 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 I don't like to mess with INI &I files. I used to be, I loved doing that, but these days I'm like, I don't want to review a game based on how I was able to hack it together. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, and then probably part of it is just game design. They want it to to feel compact and close together and, you know, and that just results in a, a small feeling game world. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you're doing like a corridor shooter, but you want the space to feel a little bigger, then, you know, you put the player in their little play pen and say, okay, well, there's some wrecked cars here that you can't go over. And then there's a whole long street beyond the wrecked cars, but you can't get to it. And so it's trying to pretend like there's more out there, but there isn't much. It's just a little bit. It's just like one street. Again, the half-life level problem. Yeah, box canyons and stuff. It, right. I didn't see much where you were standing on top of a mountain looking out at a grand vista. I, maybe it's there, but... In Outer Worlds? Yeah. Yeah, I I never got off the initial... No, I did. I got to the... You start on that first world, and then you get to like a space station kind of thing. And that's where my game ended. So I don't know. I probably shouldn't talk so much about a game I haven't seen in a year. All right, well, now we've definitely done a show. So to wrap that question up, the problem with scale is that I don't know what I'm doing, and I have no sense of scale. <laughs> At All least right. you know it shouldn't be negative 90 feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, that means you need to, in uh, Blender, you need to hit Control-A, and you need to reset all translations and uh, scale. Alt-A, yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks to everybody who sent in questions. If you have a question for the show, the email is diecast at SeamusYoung.com. We've got a few left in the mailbag now. We'll hopefully get to those next week. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye, Paul. Goodbye, Paul.